In the vast Pacific Ocean lies Midway Island, a serene landscape with a tumultuous past. At the epicenter of its historic turning point was John Ford, a legendary film director known for his masterful storytelling. On Midway, Ford's script was not born from imagination, but forged by the harsh reality of war. Today, we explore this incredible intersection of art and life in our journey into the story of John Ford at Midway Island, a testament to human resilience, courage, and sacrifice under extraordinary circumstances. After Pearl Harbor, I was asked by the Secretary of the Navy and the Secretary of War to go to Honolulu and give a factual photographic film account of the action there. So I left with a crew about January 4, 1942, and arrived there about 12 days later and got to work. We found Pearl Harbor at that time in a state of readiness. Everybody had learned their lesson from Pearl Harbor. The Army and the Navy, all in good shape, everything taken care of, patrols going out regularly, Everybody in high spirit was courageous in a spirit of hope that I have ever seen. I was particularly interested in our new blue jacket or U.S. Navy enlisted men. He was a man of unlimited education, background. He had evidently left a good trade. He was a fighting man. In a few months, I was to see what a good fighting man he was. The first task force I went on, I was called by Admiral Nimitz on the phone. I knew him quite well and he said, throw a bag together and come out here and see me. So I left immediately and went out to Pearl Harbor and saw him. He told me to report to Admiral Bagley. I left there immediately and went down to the harbor, got into the speedboat and caught a destroyer that was leaving. Got on board while it was in motion, while she was underway. Hadn't the slightest idea what I was doing, where I was going. I found out when I got on board that the destination was Midway. After we had been out a couple of days, we picked up a flotilla of PT boats, I think we picked them up at French Frigate Shoals, refueled them and gave them food. It was the first time I had seen the PT boys. And that, gentlemen or ladies, whoever is listening, that is really an outfit, that is really a wonderful group of boys. I have nothing but the utmost admiration for them. We proceeded then to Midway. I think at the time there was some report of some action impending some place or some movement in the seas since everything and everybody was on KV, a form of alert. I proceeded to make a pictorial history of Midway. I photographed the Goonie Birds, I photographed the PTs and all that sort of thing. I didn't believe much in the impending action. If it did come, I didn't think it was going to touch us. So I worked, spent about 12 hours a day in work, had a good time up there, a wonderful station. On June 3rd, my friend Massey Hughes, Commander Massey Hughes, asked me to take the patrol with him the next day. He said, he speaks in a southern accent, he said, well it looks like there's going to be a little trouble out there. To resume Massey Hughes, he says, Well, it might be some trouble tomorrow. You and I are too damned old for this war anyway, so we better take the easy dog leg. That was the Northeast Triangle segment of the aerial patrol route, so we got aboard, took off. It was very, very cloudy weather. Didn't see anything for a long time. Finally, the radar picked up something. We presumed it was one of our task forces. About 60 miles off, we saw through a rift in the clouds as we started to go over, we suddenly saw a couple of cruiser planes coming for us. Taking a quick look, we realized they were Japanese. We hadn't any idea that we had seen their task force, so Massey did a quick bank, got up in the clouds, stayed there for a while, finally ran out of clouds. We got down to about three feet from the water and really got some speed out of that old PBY. At one time, he said he thought he was doing about 89 miles an hour. We managed to get back. It's too bad we just saw the task force for a moment, it was so far away. Otherwise I might have gotten a good picture of the disposition and so forth. But we did get a pretty accurate, just in a flash, we got a pretty accurate view. You could tell pretty much what was there. The next morning, that night we got back and evidently something was about to pop. Great preparations were made. I was called into Captain Samard's office. They were making up plans and he said, well now, Ford, you are pretty senior here, and how about you getting up top of the powerhouse, the power station, where the phones are? He said, do you mind? I said, no, it's a good place to take pictures. He said, well, forget the pictures as much as you can, but I want a good, accurate account of the bombing. He said, we expect to be attacked tomorrow. And he told me to do the best I can, get out, lay out my phones. I had some wires, two phones with the wires leading to the command dugout, and then I had a sea phone, stationed those, got everything ready, tried them out, went to bed that night upstairs, got a bedroom there, went to sleep, and early the next morning everybody had breakfast. There were about eight marines in the powerhouse with me. 
I think the alarm, of course, I haven't any notes, but the alarm went off, I imagine around 6.20. So everybody took their stations and Midway became sort of a deserted island. I imagine the Japs when they attacked thought they had caught us napping, there was nothing moving, just a lazy sort of a tropical island. Everything was very quiet and serene. I had a pair of powerful binoculars with me and finally spotted the Japanese planes. I picked them out to be zeros by what in picture identification we thought would be zeros. They evidently were. The first flight I saw there were about 12 planes. They were coming at about 10,000 feet, so I reported this to the command post, told them that the attack was about to begin. Everybody was very calm. I was amazed, sort of, at the lackadaisical air everybody took. You know, everybody sort of took to the line of duty, as though they had been living through this sort of thing all their lives. Suddenly, the leading Jap plane peeled off. As he peeled off, evidently the Marines fighter planes who had left earlier got the rear plane which went down in flames. I photographed that, but my eyes were sort of distracted by the leading plane. The leader of the Japanese aircraft squadron, who dove down to about 5,000 feet, did some maneuvers and then dove for the airport. We have all heard stories about this fellow who flew up the ramp on his back, but it was actually true. He dove down to about 100 feet from the ground, turned over on his back, and proceeded leisurely flying upside down over the ramp. Everybody was amazed. Nobody fired at him until suddenly some marine said, What the hell? Let go at him and then shot him down. He slid off into the sea. But by this time, of course, everybody had been watching this fantastic thing, and by that time hell started to break loose around there, and of course the high-altitude bombers started to come in. The Zeros evidently, what I took to be Zeros, had evidently some sort of small caliber bombs. They started to plaster the ramps or the airfield. They did a very neat job. They went up and down and got the outside area. They didn't touch the field itself. I imagine their idea was to land there later that day themselves. They didn't drop any bombs on the landing mat itself, but did a thoroughly good job of dropping, I would say, 200-pounder bombs up and down outside. Of course, I mean the American planes had all been pretty well scattered, and they didn't get any. And as I was saying about this time, the high-altitude Japanese bombs started dropping. This I reported to Captain Samard. Forgot to try to count Japanese planes and do photography. I got a pretty good estimate I estimated about that I saw with my own eyes I would figure there was from 56 to 62 planes. By this time the attack had started in earnest. There was some dive bombing at objectives like water towers. They got the hangar right away. I was close to the hangar and I was lined up on it with my camera, figuring it would be one of the first things they got. It wasn't any of the dive bombers that got it. A Zero flew about 50 feet over it and dropped a bomb and hit it, the whole thing went up. I was knocked unconscious, just knocked me goofy for a bit and I pulled myself out of it. I did manage to get the picture, you may have seen it in the movie, The Battle of Midway. It's where the plane flies over the hangar and everything goes up in smoke and debris. You can see one big chunk coming for the camera. Everybody of course, nearly everybody except the gun crews were underground. The Marines did a great job. There was not much shooting, but when they did, it was evidently the first time these boys had been under fire, but they were really well trained. Our Blue Jackets and our Marine gun crews seemed to me to be excellent. There was no spasmodic firing, there was no firing at nothing. They just waited until they got a shot, and it usually counted. The planes started falling, some of ours a lot of Jap planes. It seems when you hit a Zero plane, it almost immediately goes into flames. At least that was the impression I got. One Japanese fellow dove, I think he was going to attack the clubhouse. He dove, dropped a bomb, and tried to pull out and crashed into the ground. The place that I was manning, I didn't realize the powerhouse, but they evidently tried to get that. I think we counted 18 bombs, some big, some 200 pounders, some 500 pounders that dropped around that. I would say that the Jap high altitude bombing was bad. I don't know whether they hurried or not, but they were not hitting their objective. Of course, incendiaries set fire to the wooden buildings. It seemed as though they were doing a lot of damage. Actually, they were buildings that had been used since the Pan American Airlines, which had previously had a Trans-Pacific seaplane fueling outpost. They hit an oil tank, but it was an old unused oil tank that hadn't any oil in it. And then there was a fake plane in the center of the field, and they really wasted a lot of time blowing that up. They strafed it and finally dropped a 200-pounder on it. They really, they lost about three planes trying to get that fake plane as it came into a cone of American fire that was pretty dangerous. 
During this, I suddenly saw the PT boats which were circling around open up. They did a tremendous amount of damage. The Japs couldn't figure what the hell they were and they really gave the place a wide berth. I would say the PTs were responsible for about three planes and they drove the fighters and low bombers. They pretty well drove them off because that 13 boats out there were with those multiple 50 cals. That is too much firepower. They put up an awful blast. The raid wasn't over, still a few bombs dropping now, but of course you couldn't restrain the Blue Jackets, I mean they would run out when a plane would fall. There was about 50 Blue Jackets around it trying to haul the Jap out of the plane, getting souvenirs, and you would see some ensign or lieutenant junior grade screaming, Get the hell back there! And the fellows would look, and they would go back. They were all pretty jolly about it. The Marines with me? I took one look at them and I said, Well, this war was won. They were kids, oh, I would say from 18 to 22, none of them were older. They were the calmest people I have ever seen. They were up there popping away with rifles, having a swell time, and none of them were alarmed. I mean, a Japanese bomb would drop through, they would laugh and say, my god, that one was close. I figured then, well, if these kids are American kids, I mean, this war is practically won. I was really amazed, I thought that some kids, one or two, would get scared, but no, they were, they were having a time of their lives. Each one of the eight claimed he had brought down a Japanese plane with rifle fire. They certainly fired enough at them. They had a good time. Of the 18 Japanese bombs dropped around the powerhouse, one finally grazed the corner off and filled the place full of smoke, and that caused these kids to start looking for me. They came in and bandaged me up and said, Don't go near that Navy doctor. We will take care of you. This guy over here, Jones, is a swell doctor. Talking right under fire like that, it was very interesting. Well, finally the attack was over and we went around counting heads. What made it unfortunate, they made one hit on a dugout that a marine detachment was in on Sand Island. I think they killed about 16 men there. Of course, there were quite a few casualties, dead and wounded, but that was a lucky hit, and that was just too bad. Otherwise, the bombing didn't mean anything. As we know now, I guess it's no secret, Midway was not really protected at the time, I mean it was sort of a peacetime station. We had very few 20mm anti-aircraft guns, had no 40mm, and even at that time there were quite a few 30 caliber machine guns there, which strangely enough they did very, very effective work. The marine gunners and our navy gunners were really excellent, I have never seen a greater exhibition of courage and coolness under fire in my life, and I have seen some in my day. Those kids were really remarkable, and as I said before, I figured, well, this war is over. At least we are going to win it if we have kids like that. There are no incidents that I can report. I mean, there is nothing particularly... Oh, I did see, I did see one of our kids jump in a parachute. I think it was a marine flyer. It was quite a distance away and I had... That is, I couldn't photograph it. I had to look at it through my field glasses. This kid jumped and this zero went after him and shot him out of his parachute harness. That was observed by about eight people. The kid hit the water and the Jap went up and down strafing the water where he had landed and even sunk the parachute and filled that full of holes, which I thought wasn't very chivalrous at the time. I only prayed to God that I could have gotten a picture out of it. That was verified. A lot of people did see it. Pretty soon the Marines fighter pilots started back. A lot of them badly shot up. Some had to make emergency landings on the field. And well, we all went about our job, taking care of the wounded and getting things ready and putting out fires, which was very, very quickly done. Then of course, after that, I mean, things were exciting for the next two or three days. Planes kept coming in and going out. We got reports of the naval battle and the submarines came in, and after the battle, after a few days, we went back to the peaceful routine. That night, I forgot to say, a Japanese submarine came in and started shelling the island. He came up, I imagine, about a mile away and I heard the first rumble and I ran out there and saw him fire. He fired about six times. I think he was firing at the airfield, but his shots were way over. One Marine 5-inch coastal defense artillery gun let go and I am positive he got a hit on the submarine because there was a yellowish-greenish flash out there. And from then on, we didn't hear any more from the submarine. It was very amusing. A very amusing incident occurred there. This Marine sergeant was sound asleep really tired, and one of the kids ran up and said, Hey, Sergeant, wake up, wake up, God damn it, we are being attacked. And he started pulling on his mattress. And he said, Where, where, what is it? And the young Marine said, A submarine. And the Sergeant said, Oh, Shaw, and went back to sleep.
Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. See you soon.